now give the floor to Jose Gregorio Cotua, who will be continuing with the presentation. Let me briefly introduce Jose Gregorio Cotua. He is a friend of LACNIC. He has been with us for many tutorials, and we had two new topics now. But this is the first time that we have three that the three of us are in person here. So we managed to achieve that. Jose Gregorio Cotua, he's from Venezuela. He lives in Chile. He has been there for more than seven years. He graduated from the University of Simón Bolívar. He has a master's degree in project management. And his ex experience in the IPv6 world and GPON is very vast. If you uh, see the autonomous systems he has worked on, he has contributed to the adoption of IPv6 in a significant way. Today we have a new topic, which is prefix delegation, DHCPv6 PD, which is prefix delegation of, as I was saying. I have a couple of technical issues, but this is the first time that I'm in LACNIC in person. I couldn't go to previous events in person. I only participated remotely, but it's a pleasure to be here in person with Wesley and Alejandro, my two colleagues. I have been working with them for quite a long time remotely, but this is the first time that we are here in person. It's a real pleasure for me. So, going directly into the topic, and as part of these points that we have been seeing in IPv6 only, I'm going to speak today about something that we call prefix delegation or DHCPv6 prefix delegation. Let's wait a couple of minutes until we have the presentation up on the screen. Será que tengo que entrar a donde dice webinar, sí, ¿verdad? Go to webinar ya. Sí. Perdón. Ok, ahora sí voy entonces. Ahí está. Ahora sí. Bien. Entonces, vamos a. So we're going to go directly into the topic. This topic has quite a number of technical issues and is strongly related to all the issues that support the IPv6 only architecture. And as Jordi was saying, everything has been prepared so that when we face the IPv6 only context, we have all the required elements in terms of protocols and technologies so that everything works smoothly. And one of the advantages we need are massive networks, those where we have millions and tons, dozens, dozens of millions of clients, and we have to provide provisioning for all these customers. So I prepared my presentation in four different parts. The first will be the discussion, namely what is the technical requirement that 
leads to requiring a new protocol like the prefix delegation. What does this solve and why do we need a new provisioning system in IPv6? And why is it not enough to continue doing what we have been doing with IPv4? So this is about understanding why and the need for this. After that, we'll be looking at the technical aspects to know more about the details, how they work with the architecture of the operations, the operation models, and a couple of things compared to DHCP version 4, which is the one we know traditionally. So things have evolved and there are some new things. After that, we'll be speaking about engineering and design. We know we need it. And we will now see what we do it, what are the best practices and recommendations and those elements that we have to bear in mind when we design something to provide provisioning for an IPv6 only network. And finally, we'll have a demo to show you how we work and how these operate. So first of all, there are a couple of questions to better understand the need for this new protocol. In the transition of IPv4 only to IPv6 only, there are a number of questions that arise also in dual stack scenarios. One of these is why do we need a new additional provisioning protocol in IPv6 networks? Why it is not enough to deliver only IP addresses? And how does the provisioning system change in IPv6 networks compared to IPv4 networks. Why do we now do provisioning delegating prefixes and not IPv6 addresses only? This will be the key point of the protocol which we have to whereby we have to deploy a system and manage that provisioning not only of IPv6 addresses but also in addition to that the prefixes. We have to understand the concept of prefixes clearly and which are the prefix lengths, how these blocks that are assigned to the clients are managed in the network at each of the subscribers. So what does it mean to delegate prefixes and what network scenarios do we use these new mechanisms? So these are the questions we are going to answer. In IP, version 4. In IP version 4, let us review what we did with IPv4. So IPv4 is based on the NGN models. We can subdivide the network of an ISP into the border network, into the transport network, into the applications and services, in the core part, which is a control part and finally the access network where we have all the devices for the access units, the OLT, the Neiman, and through to the subscriber network. We'll do provisioning in a network like this. If we do this, we're going to deliver provisioning to the router CPE. Previously, the CPE devices on the client side worked in layer two. The clients were directly connected to the provider network, but 15 years ago, this model has changed somewhat. So the client has a router on the border, which we call the CPE in IPv4. We divide the router in the LAN interface and the WAN interface. Now, basically, what we have to do in IPv4 is to reach the WAN interface and give an instruction to the CPE to do the first NAT. This is NAT 4.4. On the LAN side of the CPE, we do private addressing. So there are situations where the client requests public addressing on the LAN side, and in some specific cases, this can be assigned. Now, traditionally, the client works with RFC 918, which is private addressing. It does an initial nutting in the CPE, and then the provider sees the one interface of the CPE. Now, this CPE interface doing the NAT can work in PPPoE, it can work in PoE and Ethernet, and also with static variants, DHCP v4, so those 
would be the mechanisms that the operator does to assign the CPE in order to browse, which is the IP address, the mask, the DNS, and some other options such as a domain name, NTP, and so on, through the DHCP options. Now, from the standpoint of the provider, the provider has to pay attention to the provisioning to reach this part here. As operators, we have the concern of reaching the WAN interface. And what is behind the CPE is, quote unquote, uh, masked by the first NAT that is done on the CPE. So the provisioning system has a role of addressing and routing the one interface of the CPE, the public CPE, or with private addressing, depending on the amount of IP resources that that ISP has. And some use VPPoE, some use DHCP, and some use static addressing. But when we speak about thousands and millions of clients, then static addressing becomes quite inefficient in scaling up. Then uh, the ISP close to the border can uh, do a second NAT. So that would be a NAT 444. And then another NAT uh, to use uh, the public IP resources to uh, reach the internet because the internet uh, demands public uh, <coughs> internet. So this is uh, in a nutshell because this uh, provision um, uh, process is uh, systematize it, uh, there are authorizations and it has to be linked to a client management system and to monitoring systems. And in some cases, the largest uh, ISPs have a centralized device known as the BNG Brass to manage the clients at a less, uh, session level and to Inter be an intermediate in the uh, requests of uh, HDCP, HCP. So they receive uh, them, they uh, um, authenticate them, and then they request uh, the uh, transactions uh, and start navigating. And there may also be a bandwidth uh, control uh, functions. This is uh, uh, in very short terms, uh, how things work in IEPv4 uh, provisioning. So we've been doing this for 20 or 30 years uh, uneventfully. Now, when we go to IPv6, things change a bit, essentially, because in IPv6, we do not have private IP addresses. And the idea is that uh, the clients, any devices in the client's network would have a who are provisioning and uh, for instance now with the internet of things and uh, the refrigerator the washing machine um, the <laughs> shoes of a client have an IP address because they are smart devices well that smart device has a GUA uh, address at least one well because you have all the technology for the temporary addresses and the a device may have several IP V6 addresses and that changes the full landscape because now the processing has to reach the uh, final device, the tablet, the smartphone, the PC, uh, the blender, and the lamp in uh, the room, in your bedroom that uh, uh, turns in and off uh, with an IP address. It needs a GUA address that needs to be uh, assigned and managed by the provide by the vendor so that poses additional challenges in addition what we did in the past over the interface when uh, ISP the, the, we, I still have to do it so the this these are additional things in the past I only had to reach here now I have to do the whole thing with some premises and some issues that I need to consider for instance that the client has the right and it may have not just one network sometimes we make a mistake because i learned this from geordie that we see the client as a single network but the uh, the client has a lan network and that's it with ipv6 that's a mistake because in ipv6 we have to provide services thinking that uh, one uh, client may have a 10 uh, 50 1000 
uh, networks, one per device, and not even be connected. It may be as large as a client wants, so clients should have the right of being assigned a complete address. If they have an Internet of Things network with 10,000 devices and wants to provide IP to all of them, it needs to be feasible. So then the paradigm shifts because the client is a cloud that is behind an ISP that has a network the size uh, they want, and then we should be able to address it. So in IPv6, the resources that are endless and we don't have the problem of exhaustion so we should be able to give as many addresses as the clients want so here notice that the architecture of uh, the network of operators is the same they continue to have the border uh, um uh, well all, all from uh, the uh, cpe here is the same their eng the brass but now you include an IPv6 layer, and it has to work in parallel with, with the IPv6, IPv4 uh, layer until we complete the transition passing to IPv6 only, but in, initially this has to go in parallel, so that changes things. What must we do? How must we think? How should we solve this problem? What should we provide in IPv6? Well, I have to do two things. First, I need to provide, to provision. I, I sometimes, well, um, the interface one of uh, the CPE router, so I solved this problem. I gave uh, addresses to um, uh, this router and to, to, <coughs> provision the to provide the LAN network or networks of uh, the CP router. So everything in between that I'm not aware of, but there may be a network that is directly connected, I must uh, provide addresses. But in addition, as a CPE is a router, there's a process that uh, arises as a consequence of that. And it's that when I assign routing in terms of prefix for the client's network, I don't do anything, and this is very important, I don't do anything. Um, it doesn't suffice uh, giving addresses if I don't route it. Uh, I can say, well, this is your IP, but if as an operator I don't route it, I don't allow the packets uh, reaching uh, your um, uh, network, so you are disconnected. So you have a third process, and that is, I must ensure uh, at, the, at the bottom of the right uh, square, that box, that um, the um, that the addresses need to be routed uh, through the internet. The first prefixes, I remember the first uh, trials of uh, the prefixes addressing with Microtik and the first versions of the earlier releases of version 3. Now, by now, it's already version uh, 7 a it delegated the prefixes but didn't route them so the cpe received uh, the prefixes but they received no routes so it remained a cult but in uh, versions uh, 620 630 microtik started routing so this is something that we have to mention the prefix assigned needs to be routed or if not the cpe receiving it needs to address it to route it because I know that I assigned it, but the entire network of the operator needs to know that all the prefix is in that CPE. So it's three things Ad um, addressing the one of the CPE, the LAN, and uh, to route the prefixes. So that's the new thing. That's what creates the need of what we're going to discuss today that is known as DHCP version 6 PED or prefix delegation. Okay. Of course, this has variants, including, for instance, that in some cases, people continue to use, in my view, it's wrong, and not uh, 6.6, six, um, to use uh, for left of that side, uh, but I, I, I'm not going to, the, uh, what? so I'm going to go to the right uh, setting with everything, GUA, and I'm going to try to address prefixes for the LAN side. So, taking this to the most common scenario today, let's uh, land, uh, because, well, 
all of us are starting to walk or we're already we've been walking for a while with the jeepon issue and here there are many things you can do it so between the operator and the client the jeepon network goes here there i put uh, the olt odn those are networks and jeepon from here to here now there's a new issue that arises because OLT may operate in layer 2 or layer 3 and there things change because if you work in layer 2 it makes uh, the provisioning uh, transparent but if I I have the OLT that is routing and the CPE also and I have an intermediate thing then I need to know how to solve this so and th this can turn can change depending on the border of the network if they have brass if they don't if they centralize their provisioning if it's distributed but the the goal is the same I need to provision the smartphone there you had a prefix delegation at the store uh, well the 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 goal is that that mountain there needs to be addressed. They should have an IP v6 address, at least one, and with that IP, uh, and it should be able to browse with that IP v6 address. And hopefully, it will be IP v6 only, because if not, the operator will have to invest a lot to NAT, and the traffic will be cleaner. You won't overburden um, uh, the machine. There will be uh, longer lags. So these are all improvements in an end-to-end -end network uh, that uh, uh, spare many of those connections. And so this is the goal. And that is the need. That is what we know as prefix delegation. So let's summarize some things. First of all, in IPv6, there is no I, a private IPv IP, no NAT66. Some vendors have it as an ad additional option, but I don't like it. Precisely what we want is not to do anything, so I think it's going backwards. All the addressing is uh, GUA. And so we have a, on a, a LAN side IPv6 addressing in the CPE and there are questions that we already guess. How do we assign in an autonomous, uh, aut automated manner? When you, when you answer these questions, please remember that you are not speaking of 100 or 1,000 clients. Think of India or China. I remember once I was in Buenos Aires, I was giving an OLT um, a source uh, and I said, well, send a reset so we can start from zero. And I had 37,000 clients. Uh, and they didn't tell me that um, it was that uh, large. So imagine that you're in China. There are OLTs that have 256 pon, uh, points, and in each one has 128 clients. And the router may be providing services to six, seven OLTs. So it's very easy that you may have the 300,000 clients and all of them need to get service and hopefully it will be automated, centralized. Imagine that each time the client uh, turns uh, the, uh, the system in an, um, uh, on and out, uh, you would have a new routing. Then if you ha multiply that times uh, a 1,000 clients, it's massive and everything needs to be centralized with uh, the due considerations, whether it's redundant, etc. So it's not the same if you are operating with a thousand clients or a hundred thousand clients. Today we are working with a project in Costa Rica with uh, half a million uh, clients. So, and uh, the uh, GUA, and, uh, and finally, I forgot to put it. Remember that uh, the clients have a right and uh, they can have thousands of networks. If they want a thousand networks, they need to be able to do it. We need to give them that possibility. Routing. After assigning an address, how do we route it? That was that used to be a problem at a time. I remember having seen even the scripts that whenever you assigned a prefix, the script would run and add a route of the delegated prefix, but not just adding it, but then you have to remove it when it changes, so you had to synchronize that. Now, by now, everything is automated. I So I assign it and I route it, or if not, uh, and then uh, 
addressing of uh, the one phase, how do we address that? And that's debatable because in IPv6, IPv4, technically, it's a CPE that uh, navigates. That's the IP that I see. So it's the CPE that needs to have the IP, but not in IPv6. In IPv6, it's the client that is uh, browsing the OLT. Um, does not browse or it shouldn't. So it may have GUA, it may have a LLA, that's a link local address, and no problems. And it is true that it could have ULA. We are going to discuss that later. And in addition, how do you integrate the whole thing with uh, the transition mechanisms we have deployed? If it's an SLA and NAT64, if there's a bunch of things in the CPE that either add or subtract in the transition mechanism, right? So, summarizing, I've been told that I've run out of time. So, on the side of a land, uh, the land side of CPE, not one network, but hundreds. And Aquí, en redes masivas, no estamos hablando de subneteo. En mi criterio, no pierdan tiempo subneteando más allá de barra 64. Eso es en IP versión 4 porque teníamos escasos recursos. Aquí todo es barra 64. ¿okay? La verdad es que yo no sé por qué algunos operadores siguen insistiendo en barra 127, 126. La verdad es que yo no lo entiendo. Pero bueno, alguna, en algún momento me lo explica. Behind the CPE, we have to think that everything is NAT64. Whenever a CPE receives, receives a delegated prefix, it's a slash 64. It needs a network, it's a slash 64. It's always slash 64, and that's it. There's no way around that. So each prefix is taken from a delegated prefix. I receive the delegated prefix, I include it in a pool, and I get a slash 60. It's 16 slash 64s. I make this available to the system. I, you need a network. There you have it. I had 16. How many do you still have? 15. You need one more? 14. I left. And if you want to use the 16, you can do so. No le de resquemor. So don't be afraid of assigning 100,000 prefixes to a client. Nothing, there's no problem. I think LACNIC is also going in that direction. So give the clients as much as they need. So give them excess slashes. You give them, it's okay, give them as many as you wish. In each LAN, the CPE will deliver that prefix in three different ways with RA, with DH, plus DHCP, with static routing, and even the CPEs have static routing. I can let us have a delegated prefix inwards towards the subscriber. And there's a question outside the scope of this presentation. How many slash 64 do we assign? Or what should the size of the delegated prefix be? So here you have the link to a webinar that Alejandro gave us. And So that link there describes the issue of assigning a slash 60 or slash 56. So in my opinion, technically speaking, the subscribers should receive more than a slash 48, a smaller prefix than a slash 48, but not higher than a slash 64, and in practical terms, not more than a slash 60 and less than a slash 48. LACNIC, following the standard, says that one would tend to conclude that you have to assign, allocate a slash 48, but it's not so simple. A slash 48 are 65,000 slash 48, so I have 400,000 subscribers, that's not them. So I'll show you a table now where you can estimate this. Now, by no means less than a slash 60 and not bigger than a slash 48. A slash 48 is 4.2 million C correction files, 65,000 slash 64s. So that is an issue for an entirely different webinar, the prefix size, the size of the prefix, delegated prefix. Now, how 
do you use this? The CPE says I need a prefix. I go and ask for one. I get a delegated prefix, and here it is. I got a slash 56, where 256 slash 64s. So what do I do now? First, you must remember that if you received a delegated prefix, assigning a delegated prefix is not associated to any direct assignment of any interface. The delegated prefix is I want or I need a delegated prefix, and the server then assigns this. It says, OK, you have a slash 56. The CPE then, or the router that receives it, includes it in a pool. And there it is. So what can I use this for? For whatever I wish. To put it in a loopback, or to put it in a VLAN interface, to route it towards an internal network, always in the understanding that it's going to be divided into slash 64. Some systems take the prefixes in sequences from 1 through 64, the second, the third, and so on. And sometimes the operator has the option of using a mask. I say, well, from the delegated prefixes, I want to use number five or number seven or number eight. But if I don't say anything, I just take the first. I want another one, I take the second one and the third. And if I got 256 slash 64s and I only used one, it's okay. You have all the other 255. We must not penalize the client because they just use one. We have to favor the fact that at some moment they might need 1,000. So the HTCP, DHCP v6 protocol does not define how to use a slash 64s. You just assign, uh, request it, and you get these assigned. The use is defined by the CPE and the one who does the program of the CPE. That's why in GPON, when the CPE receives this, I do the program and I say, well, take the first slash 64, put it in the Wi-Fi, and deliver it through RA and through DHCP. An important point. I think this is very interesting. One of the important points is that this interface over here, the LAN of the CP, does not need any GUA, GUA. Now, in fact, it doesn't even use it because it can perfectly well deliver DHCP and RA. The ONTs normally use F80, 2.1, and that's become quite popular. So I deliver DHCP and RA. I don't need GUA over there. The GUA, the, the client needs the GUA, not the CPE. So the CPE receives the prefix and will then deliver these. And to deliver them, it doesn't need the GUA. It needs a link local address. And this is quite interesting because the default gateway of the clients is a link local address. And it doesn't need GUA in the one. So I do provisioning from here to here, but the CPE, technically speaking, does not need GUA. It will need um, one uh, for other purposes, to go through the web. So having seen this, let us now go into the technical aspects. How do I do addressing of the CPE? I leave it in the link local address. I don't need to manage the ONT. I just leave that in the link local address. So it's a GUA. So with the access router that does RA, because the CPE does need the default gateway. It does need the default gateway and the DNSs, so that these are permeate, permeated inwards. So the link local address might provide GUA and eventually do OLA. What addressing methods do I use to do the one interface of the CP? I can use PPPoE or the IPoE, manually a static DHCP v6. The simple one, it can also be Slack with RA in client mode. And this is what we know as automatic configuration. This is for the CPE, the one CPE, this part over here, this part over here. Now, going on to delegation, let us, uh, okay, let me remind you 
this slide over here, a very simple one. This is to remind you of the RA process. Alejandro spoke about this extensively. This is in case you wish to use the one of the CPA in mode RIA client. So this could be the OLT, or it could be the device on the top. This does RA and provides addressing to the CPE. And also the default gateway, which is the most important thing. This is the default gateway for the CPE, otherwise no writing to the client's networks can be done. So we all know how RA works. I'm not going to go into all these details. This is sent out over every given amount of time. And then the default gateway resolves the MAC address. So this is the initial part, which has to do with understanding the need and the processes that now interacting, which is the path that we will be following from now onwards. Now let us look at the technical aspects. Let us have a look at how the prefix delegation works. Any questions so far? Please ask questions if you have any. Any questions? There's a remote question from Henry Godoy. It has been common to use ULA addresses to manage CPEs. Has that been common? Well, I haven't seen that very much. Maybe the sample I have is not very big, but I haven't seen very much the operator ends up using GUA for managing the CPE. So what we do is that if we wish to protect the CPE so it has no traffic from and towards internet with GUA, then we can divide the slash 32 into six, slash six, 36, and we don't, and we can also do filtering if you don't wish to have external access. But I've seen that very little. and. What are your experiences using GUA to manage CPEs to go to your zero Well, I haven't seen that management in IPv6, but it's not because it doesn't work, but because those who have this protocol to 069, this allows you to manage a CPE at level of configuration on the land side and the power to see the users and so on, those who have followed that path have had good experience in IPv4 and because this is a stable environment and because they're in a process of transition to IPv6 until they don't finish working with the IPv6 there, they don't, we won't go over to that option. This does not mean that it's not going to work. I think it's going to work anyway, much in the same way as with IPv4. DR069 has been used with cloud servers, and cloud servers not always support IPv6 for DR069. This is something that will come in in the coming years. Does this answer the question? Any more questions? Hello, I'm Ernesto Sanchez from Argentina. With IPv4 and NAT for the end user, they have the impression of security because this is a private LAN and this does not allow access from outside. So with IPv6, I have to think that I have to include a firewall. I have to figure out how to make that final device secure. Now it's public end to end. Let me answer the question with something I learned from Jordi. I think he's one of my masters. I think it's not true that a natted network is more secure than a non natted network. We have that impression. No one tends to think that because it is occult, it is more secure. So based on that, a solution that has IPv6 through to the client would not suggest being 
more secure because otherwise all the servers that have public IPv4 would be equally insecure. And the CPEs too, because ultimately CPEs that have public IPs would also be insecure. So that's the starting point. I think that security is an architecture. Security involves many things that I have to do. And it should be based on the fact that the same criteria, the same standards, the main security elements for IPv4 should also be included in IPv6. So I have a firewall in IPv4, I should also have one in IPv6. And in IPv6, there are additional things, for example, the ward or RA ward, because these are specific things like the multicast and to protect the multicast. I'm not an expert on security, but I would say that I cannot understand the IPv6 project, and we also have to view these as project, not as something that has to be there by Friday and I do the transition. Well, we have always tried to convey the concept that you have to see everything as a project. So where do I stand now? Where do I wish to go? And this has to be sort of comprehensive. And as part of that in comprehensive concept, we have to include security. I cannot carry out a transition with weak security in IPv4. If I have a firewall in IPv4, I have to do it in IPv6. Jose, thank you for your clarification. I'd like to add here that although the networks have IPv6, the majority of the vulnerabilities still remain in the IPv4 networks, even though they are behind the net, because the main issue of security is expressed in one single word, the users. The doors are opened from the inside. So there's no point in having IPv6 networks and without security, or both with security if the user through the inside opens up the door of vulnerability. So even though the IPv6 is expanding the implementation and adoption worldwide, we can see among the main vulnerability indicators and invasions that these still occur through IPv4 networks, although they are behind that. You don't even need to have a public IP in order to receive an invasion. Go ahead, George. Te puedo aportar una cosa, eh, aunque de algún modo tú ya lo has dicho. Eh, igual que un NAT. Mentioned it just as NAT, it should be protected because in the past it used to, used to have a public IP, and when I say NAT, that's a CPE, they need to be protected. Today, most uh, CPEs that incorporate NAT, actually what they have is a combination of NAT plus a firewall, a stateful firewall. And that's the same thing that we need to request when we implement uh, IPv6 in a CPE. You need to have this uh, full uh, state of firewall for IPv4 and IPv6. And the usual things, I think you mentioned the closed doors. Uh, the normal thing is all the ports to be uh, closed, and it should be the user that decides what to do. Yes, the issue of connections. I always, when I have to transmit something in uh, terms of security, we, we need to understand that there are two connections, inbound and outbound. If I'm going to give uh, internet to the subscriptor, unless uh, it's, uh, if they are requesting a public IP with the transit, uh, the subscriber must have uh, open the outbound. Um, connections, not the inbound. So in the CPE, they should be closed. Yes, I only wanted to give an example that I think that IPv6 makes the network of the subscribers much more vulnerable. I work, I've worked in security for a long time, and one of the common things is um, uh, OSs that are not updated. When I have IPv4 and NAT, for instance, an OS uh, Windows 7, it has multiple vulnerabilities from the moment it's installed, and it, by little you have to correct them through I updates, but the time comes when there are no more updates to uh, keep us updated. Now, what happens with IPv4? I'm behind a CPE that is using NAT, and it's uh, hiding the ports uh, of that. But when I have an IPv6 uh, now, that device with Windows 7 or even Windows 10 and Linux, etc., now they have a public uh, IP, and it can be scanned internationally. Anybody can look for that IP, scan it, see what ports are active, and 
get into those one uh, of those exploits. So when there is a public IP, as it is version six, it's exposed. Uh, it's vulnerable. In the past, it wasn't. I understand the use. It's uh, up. It's. Uh, the responsibility falls on the users. However, we increase the attacks, uh, the possibilities of attacks. I think that you already answered this. We can't blame the protocol if the user is not updating their OS. That's a minimum requirement of security that our OSs need to be updated and the router, so everything need to be updated and with no vulnerability. We can't blame the protocol for that. And of course, I add something else. Even if it's behind, it's, it suffices if one user clicks on a link you won a hundred thousand dollars click here to cash your money that's it and that won't protect you unfortunately security problems are focused on just one point that is the user and not the protocol we can't blame the protocol or delay its implementation just because of this kind of excuse i'm not convinced unfortunately yes before listening to Jordi because I'm sure he will respond but let me give you a brief example we have IPv4 and we have open technet and we pass to IPv6 and we continue to have telnet port 23 that is open I think that the response the answer is more than clear even if there's a NAT they will uh, attack us there's going to be an explosion so you can't blame the protocol or the OSs to leave um, it uh, open you can't blame the protocol the protocol needs to be understood if you are to judge it and to deploy it, you have to uh, implement it as it works. But that's an issue where there's a lot of discussion still. I just wanted to add that you have to remember that most users uh, in households don't even know what a firewall is. So maybe the gentleman that has had the same computers for computer for six years and he's not aware of uh, the vulnerabilities, when I say that the protocol, um, the exposure that you get is uh, worse. I'm not saying uh, that uh, it's less secure. If there there's more exposure, if the vulnerabilities are there, then they're going to be explo uh, exploited. The exploits are going to be more frequent. And the uh, clients may get confused because as now the ISP is giving a different method, they don't understand that a connection is not as secure because in the past it, uh, they weren't uh, exposed and now they are. Before Jordi requests the floor, I wanted to say two things. When the internet started, the natural spirit of it was end-to-end -end connections. The concept of a NAT was not there. So at the beginning, it was just as insecure as IPv6, uh, as you mentioned it. Second, we can't go backwards or we can't stop as we transition to a more modern protocol because a user doesn't know the details. I understand that you need to consider the uh, user's view, but uh, there's a way you can handle it. Well, there are several things that have been mentioned, in the three of you, that I don't agree with at all because even from Windows IXP, where you could already activate IPv6, although it was not commercial, it was experimental, it was a beta version, there was already a firewall that was activated by default both for IPv4 and IPv6. So even if the CPE was not protected, even if it were all open, users were protected in that firewall. All the ports were closed to the extent that you c couldn't even do looping. So it was very, very closed. So it's not that you have a greater surface for exposure with IPv6, among other things, because we don't just have uh, the perimeter um, uh, firewalls. Now 80% of the attacks come from within the network. So NAT wouldn't protect us because it's the user that put a CD with a virus or a USB with a virus. So. The CPE with NAT, it's not just NAT, I repeat, it's NAT plus five firewall stateful in IPv4 and IPv6, it will not be protected. But in addition, trying to scan a network with IPv4, if we have an ADCL, well, I'm speaking of tracking uh, an IPv4 in 25 minutes in IPv6, although there are techniques for uh, 
Speeding it up, scanning just one is uh, 3.6 million years. So, in the end, you don't have a larger uh, exposure surface. Rather, the contrary, it's smaller. And obviously, and this is not just for residential users, but for corporate users that uh, deploy IPv6. And there are even ISPs that don't uh, uh, get any training. Uh, and so if you are to use IPv6, you have to unlearn IPv4. And the, the um, mail, the web, uh, is, and so there are things that are no good in IPv6. So if we want scanning, we want to stop it as much as we can. Is that if this is sl or slash 64, then the route comes to one, but the, then randomly the mail comes randomly and so on. So we have to distribute in the slash 64. We have to distribute all the services we have because in addition, we don't need to remember addresses. We are always going to use DNS. So one of the security measures that are usually used with the DNS is that you don't uh, allow for zona transmissions. So you only have internal service. Thank you. I'm David Mao. Now I have a question. When I implement IPv6 to my residential uh, end user, I'm going to expose him to inbound and uh, outbound connections in IPv6. Now my question is, should I block the inbound connections so that that specific niche of residential clients may not receive them, or what should I do? Well, the OS of the client has already blocked the inbound uh, connections because he's not a server. And if they're open, if they have any open services, it's vulnerable to the OS. What is it's 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 true that the client should not have the possibility of having them open. They should be closed, and the firewall must be closed. And if not, the CPE must come in IPv6 with a minimum uh, st uh, stateful firewall, as we do in IPv4, and we think that NAT does. Now, that the reason why I'm saying it is because I had a very interesting case with a residential client. He insisted that he had received, he had been attacked because I exposed him to IPv6. That is, that he had inbound and outbound connections to a specific device. So my position was to say, no, I'm very sorry, but I'm not in charge of the internal security in your network. I, what I can ensure is that you are protected one way or the other, but I'm not accountable for whatever may happen with the router that uh, I give you uh, in your home or with your devices. Yes, it's, it's as I said, if uh, the client has Ethernet uh, open, uh, well, it's not uh, the ISP's uh, responsibility. It shouldn't be open. Thank you for your question. Well, let me go on. Now, this topic is uh, a very rich debate. There are many things that we believe that we bring from IPv4, as Jordi said, the practices, the ways we act, uh, secure or non-secure things to do things. And we always also bring the myths, things the way we believe them to be. And we think that in, they are the same in IPv6. And sometimes there are things that are necessarily True. So, the summary of the technical details is in this chart. I won't uh, go through them one by one, but let's see the most important ones. The first thing that we need to say of DHCP uh, version 6 uh, perfect delegation is that it's not a new protocol based on the HCP. Uh, version 6. Initially, it was an extension. That is, it was an additional option in terms of a query and a answer of a DHCP v6, so that when you you got a, an, a, an IP address, you, it would deliver a prefix. And there is where you have, for instance, RFC 3315. There's another that is um, R3333 um, to include that. But then, when uh, IPv6 uh, uh, evolved uh, in the same document, they included the HCP version 6 as an extension in terms of options 
to deliver prefixes. So speaking of DHCP v6 and DHCP v6 uh, prefix relegation is the same, except that the latter requests a prefix, receives a prefix, and while DHCP is v6 is the protocol that uh, supports it. And it also supports other things and allows uh, to deliver DNS uh, or uh, HCP address. So it's like the same platform, the DHCP version 6, and in terms of options, there's an upper layer that requests addressing and prefix, among other things. It's a state-based uh, system because when the server receives a query a request of a, a delegated prefix, they keep it in their cache and, and they assign it for a certain time, who requested it, for how long, and there's a database of uh, the uh, delegated prefixes that have been uh, delivered so they w to prevent them from being uh, repeated and even the most modern modern systems keep those leasings in a database so that it can be managed uh, more effectively it's a stateful program it's a message based uh, protocol basically there's a client a server the client sends a message uh, requesting a prefix the server conducts a number of validations, response, and the client receives a prefix, and that's it. It's closed until it is renewed or returned or the time expires. So it's a protocol that basically is sustained, sustained, supported on uh, sending IP messages with uh, um, uh, um, service uh, 546 uh, uh, with ports 546 and 547 of the client and the server. And uh, it also has the option rapid commit uh, to increase the efficiency of the assignments and uh, assignments. And you don't have to do a discovery and not request it from one. So in DHCP version 6, uh, the uh, rapid commit comes uh, natively. This includes a whole series of messages to respond to this request. and. If there are any changes in DHCP v4, for example, when an OLT does relay of the requests of the DHCP, one of the things that the relay does is that intersects the request messages and includes the position of the client information and the position of the client. If the server is several hops away, it doesn't know prior to that in what OLP, VLAN, or whatever that subscriber is. So I can use an IPv4 option, which is option 82. I can include that request with information on where the subscriber is. I can say it's in port number X. And in DHCP v6, the options are different. In IPv6, we have the option 18 or 37, but this also allows the relay to include the information of where the subscriber is and which interface on which port. So if you allow me to show you something here. If you look at these options over here for the DHCP protocol in IPv4, these are the famous options. The options are identified with numbers. And this is option 82 over here that has to do with the relay agent information. The codes are not the same in IPv6, and the options are number 18. Uh, 18 and 39. So we have option number 18 and option number 39, which are not the same options. So these are highly technical details, but just to mention that some specific situations change regarding how the options are coded. So there we are. So let's have a look at the details. In the simplest scenario of all, it you will have in the same network 
connected directly is the client. The CPE over here, the CPA, will submit a request message. This IPv6 is sustained on ICMP v6 with a link local address and the multicast system. So the client sends a request message, a solicit message. This is processed, and there is a configuration that has been set up. So basically, it has a base prefix which is a slash 48 and that slash 48 i say you're going to deliver when you are have to send a prefix you're going to send a slash 56 so there we understand well the base prefix is a large prefix from which i will be taking delegated prefixes so how many slash 56 is do you have in 48 256 so 56 minus 248 and then i'll show you a table in a while so I request a prefix. The server says your prefix is 2009db8ab000 slash 56. What I have seen so far assign this sequentially. So they look at the first prefix available and then this is delivered. Now that client can be a router, an ONT, a diesel, he calls himself a modem. SMTS, a CMTS modem, and in that sense, this works very simply. I request and the server responds. The client and the server share a connected network. Of course, here in between, you can have an OLT or a microwave link or a fiber optic net link a switch or it can be connected directly. So this is the simplest scenario of all. Now, today, well, here we have the details. This is just to show you the structure of the message. At an Ethernet level, we have multicast. Then we have IPv6. The message goes from the link local address to the ADF0212, which are all the routers. In UDP, you have the ports, and basically, the client builds a message based on options, the solicit messages, and the options are what I require. And the client says what the client needs, I need a prefix. And that is known as an association of prefix delegation. So that is option. 26, if I'm not mistaken. So this option over here, option 25, is the one that when the client enters this, it's telling the server, I want a prefix. So I assign this based on options, and I then deliver these things. Now the server, when it is set up, it is done at the level of an interface. The DHCP v6 servers cannot run in dummy interfaces. They cannot run in a loopback interface. It has to be a physical interface, an Ethernet, a VLAN. So in each interface, I can create a DHCP v6 server. And if I don't get any answer, then the client resubmits this request, this solicit message, and finally, when the server responds to this message, this reply is sent to the MAC address, to the link local address, and we get the reply message. It's solicit, reply, solicit, and reply. And those solicit and replies, when we have an option 25, which is I request a prefix, then the answer is 26. That's a delegated prefix. So that reply message in option 26 has a delegated prefix. And it also includes the times which is the preferred time and the lifetime. So from that time, standpoint, it's very similar to, HCP, to DHCP. So this generates a state, and it has a database of all the prefixes that were delegated. So this process is called delegation. Solicit, validate, and deliver a prefix if one is available. 
then I have to see what the size of the base prefix is, what the size of the delegated prefix is, how many I will be provisioning. So there are many questions that have not been answered yet. Now, this scenario can become because when we have many OLTs or many points of presence, it's not so easy to say, well, I'm going to include a DHCP server in each point of presence. So that would be a distributed network. And although this could be relatively easy to deploy, managing it later on will be complicated. Imagine 100 points of presence and each with a server that does not overlap in terms of addressing. So we might say, well, what if I have a centralized system and having a centralized system implies that at the point of present, I have to have a relay so the clients receive the solicit message and then scale this up to a centralized server. So that is where a third element steps in, which is DHCP v6 relay, the relay agent. So the relay agent will request, receive the solicit message from the client. In this case, in the interface we have over here on your left, they will receive this request. This is what we we'll call the service interface and the relay will have the instruction as to where this solicit message will be scaled up. So when you receive a solicit message, these are forwarded with some changes because this now goes from multicast. Remember, IPv6 is multicast. It is converted into a unicast and is then forwarded to a server that could be connected or remotely or in the cloud or in other options. So it is then forwarded to a remote service. Now, what is the trick here? That remote server is catering for this, but also for other servers in other places. So I have one single server that assigns prefixes for all the networks. I have 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000 clients. In a, these can be in a centralized way. I can know what was assigned and at what time in a centralized manner. Now, this can be a bit more complex, and I have to see what I do if this crashes. I have to have redundancy where I place it. I have to plan things a bit better, but in terms of scaling up, an architecture like this is more convenient compared to one that is directly connected. So the important thing here is relay. Where do I place the relay? Now, the relay can be the OLT. It can be the OLT perfectly well. The relay can be the access switch, which is before the OLT, or it can be the access router that is also behind the OLT. It could be a router a point of presence. So any device that the CPEs, where the CPEs are connected directly, whether physically or other options. And where is the DHCP server? It can be anywhere in the cloud, at the data center, or even in the capital city if it is a country. And then you might have a network with rings. So if one part crashes, I have other options for redundancy. So here, we have the issue of redundancy. This server becomes very important. It's just one single server. I have several options, active, standby, active, active. I have a group of servers. Today, the relays have the option of saying, well, you can use this one, and if you don't use this, you can do a round robin. So you had Hang Hong one that responds to several ones in a country. Now, remember, we have, I have a way of doing things that whenever you're going to deploy anything, although you might have a small network, think that it might become very big and have one million clients. Hopefully you will. <laughs> Don't stop coming to Lightning if we have one million clients, but always bear in mind that what you do is should be equally valid even if you have one million clients, because if you have a solution for one million clients, you have to it's going to solve everything, but if you think small, well, you have to then relearn things and design things once again. So think that you're going to grow a lot so that things are always done in the best way possible. So what will happen is that the client sends the request. This is received by the client. 
the relay encapsulates this message and is then forwarded towards the server through unicast and remotely. This can be through a tunnel, through a VLAN, through an RF. So there are many ways of doing this and even through a pseudo wire and PLS. So there are many different ways of connecting the relay with the server. There are very many different ways. But the important thing is a concept and I won't go into the details because I want to go to the demo. This is until the server responds. Now here we have a point. And is as follows. Jordi, I would like to ask you to make a comment. So once I have the servers and once these are redundant for active and standby or a group of servers, DHCP or prefix delegators, imagine I have four. Let's assume we have four prefix delegators in X city or data center. So how do I do the subdivision of the addressing? I'll leave that question for the end. How do I select the processes? Because if uh, you request a pro prefix, the state over there is not the same as the one over there. So I have to see if the states have been synchronized. And also how the addressing plan influences when I have several centralized servers. We'll end up answering this question and Jordi will be helping us out. Okay, so these are some very technical details. In IPv4, we speak about DHCP, the way in which the client identifies the server identifies a client and the client to the server is through the MAC address. This is the same case here, but we have a new ident entity, which is DUID, which is DACPv6 unique identifier. This is an expansion of this concept and there are different ways in which the client and server are identified. But the most useful thing is using the MAC address, but with some additional parameters. I won't go into the details. But this is what we can know as the DUID. So DUID will have a syntax that looks like this. And the numbers you see here contain the MAC address, the type of UID, and a specification stating that this is a MAC address. In IPv4, it's only a MAC address. But here, this has evolved a bit. And finally, options 25 and 26, are the options through which I, I solicit and I assign um, the prefix. So when a client uh, requests one, they send uh, option 25. You don't have to learn it by heart. The important thing is that if I'm a client and uh, I request it and I do it as option 25, then there I put uh, the time parameters and I send it and the server analyzes it and responds with option 26. Option 26 brings the prefix, the longitude, uh, the length and the timing. Basically, it's that. I send and I receive. Uh, uh, be careful because it's not coded. So it's, it would be interesting to see an HCP with a delegator and with a, a coding. So then the client can do uh, rely, renew, etc. So basically, I'm going to stay with this image. That is what basically defines the most uh, complete, mo most comprehensive setting. Thousands of clients, some relies, and uh, one or several uh, DHCP servers to deliver a prefix. This could be GPON, Ethernet, MPLS, Internet. And then this in the, the cloud, but they are three big important players. And with this, I would close the technical part. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, muy bien. Eh, bueno, voy a pasar ahora a, a conversarles algunos aspectos que tienen que. So I'm going. Recomendaciones, buenas prácticas, ya. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the best practice uh, and uh, dealing with what I call uh, engineering, design, and planning. So now I know how it works. And uh, let's see how I do it. Do you have any questions? I think the most important thing is understanding it, start using it, and 
seeing the good practices of design and engineering. Yes, go ahead. Arthur Moreno. As in IPv6, there's a large number of addresses that you give users. You need, we need to uh, consider the DNS reverse of PTR, which is the best practice now when we do those delegations. Who keeps that fun that role? The provider, or are we delegating it to the end user that is receiving the IPs? Well, when LACNIC assigns your slash 32, they give you access as you are the owner of that block. They give you access so that you will have the first administration of the RDNS. In that management system, it's my understanding that there you can do the delegations and you can point out which are the DNS servers that will respond to that have the authority of that uh, DNS. You can also delegate and tell LACNIC, well, for this prefix, these are the DNS servers, and you can do it per block. I understand that more than 48, right? Any. So I can delegate up to a slash 96, for instance, or is it up to slash 64, up to the smallest? So in that process, usually what I've seen more frequently is the operator delegates uh, himself, and they Use the, they put their DNS service and they do the PTR and they can also delegate to their clients if they assign a slash 48 they can delegate to the clients uh, DNS if uh, if that's requested by the uh, client now if you go in uh, the delegated DNS uh, you can uh, make the divisions you want you can deliver a slash uh, 48 and then you can do several slash 64 and uh, whatever you use uh, oh, I'm Enriquez. I have a question. Why do you think DHCP relay and not a centralized authentication system? It's not the same. The relay delivers the prefixes and the triple A authenticates them. So we need to have somebody in between intersecting the, the uh, uh, request and uh, to go and authenticate. And once it's authenticated, the intermediate. Uh, will go and uh, request it, uh, do the solicitude to the HCP, and uh, that gets to. It's not uh, delivered to the final to the end user. The AAA doesn't uh, authenticate it, but they are different systems. In one of the first slides, you saw the browse and then the AAA, and here DHCP v, uh, six uh, version zero. So these are different systems. Thank you. So let me answer uh, uh, a couple of things uh, of the questions. One is the delegation, the D reverse DNS delegation. The truth is that it's not usual for an ISP to delegate the reverse to the client, among other things, because in order for that to work, the client needs to have a service enabling that role. Usually, my experience is that that's not very common in residential networks, but it is quite uh, common in the corporate networks, and that makes sense to a certain degree because the regular uh, residential users, not the freakers, because, well, for instance, I'm a freak and I have, and obviously, uh, residential users won't have the possibility, even if they are given the reverse. Uh, 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 DHCP. Now, the question by the person who came to the microphone, I always recommend people to read RIPE 690 because one of the very important things in IPv6 is that we need to think that the addresses that we deliver through DHCP uh, the six de process delegation to the CPEs need to persist in the to extend possible, and it's always possible, uh, depending on the vendor. I think it's option 37 of a DHCP v6 PD that allows you to always deliver the same prefix to the same client. And why? Because that will uh, allow the ISPs to give new services to clients. And for that to happen, for instance, managing their security remotely, uh, managing their domotics. 
and uh, manage their video cameras. In order for them to offer those services, the easiest, I'm not saying that there aren't any more ways, but they are more complicated. The easiest is for the clients to have stable addresses. So in RIPE 690, we speak that in order to confuse it whether it's DHCP or not, instead of dynamic addresses, we speak of persistent prefixes. So the client will always receive precisely because of the tri AAA authentication, they will receive the same prefix now. And maybe here I'm going to answer what I think that uh, you uh, said at the beginning. Now, if I have only one group of DHCPs, it may be one machine or several because of redundancy matters. Now, how can I get uh, different prefixes in different cities or regions or pops uh, make them correspond to each group of uh, clients? Well, obviously, what you need to do is that in the routing plan, you define through the AAA and through the DHCP servers, the clients of this pop will receive prefixes of this uh, group of addresses and the clients of pop2 would receive them of another group obviously the concept of persistent addresses goes hand in hand with the geographic situation to of the client that is a client that moves from uh, building A to building B, and they are next to each other, well, he's likely to receive the same prefix because it's the same pop. However, if uh, he moves to a, a different neighborhood with another pop, then it doesn't make sense to send the same uh, prefix because it will make it more complicated as you route it. Thank you. I'm Nelson Cruz of Datos Honduras. Jose, now with the issue of the one, in the presentation, I saw that you mentioned PPPoE and HTCP and static. Now, in your experience, what would you recommend? Or what needs to be borne in mind? That would be the first question. Okay. What I said was there are two ways, two mechanisms you can use to address the one of a CPE, both in I, uh, IPv4 and IPv6. A PPPoE is one uh, user password and uh, oriented to the address. And IP over internet, that's addressed doing it static or DHCP. Or, or a static or a DHCP. Those are the formulas. So that's a debate that um, if I were to choose PPPoE or DHCP, if I were asked, I would choose DHCP because I go back to the source. Uh, PPPoE, if I'm not wrong, I may be wrong, but it was when th they had an issue with the resources, so they had more requests uh, than possible answers. But w we have synchronism, for instance, I have a uh, an engineer, a copy from Venezuela. So we had uh, an issue with the PPPoE. If the client was not synchronized in NTPE, there were many misconnections. So, so apparently PPPoE would be a bit more sensitive to disconnections to the uh, networks that are tuned than DHCP. In DHCP, the network as such is not oriented. To, so I requested, I'm assigned, and in just uh, for some time I won't have to do anything. So there won't be so many disconnections in DHCP as you may have in PPoE. But that's a system. Many people would choose PPPoE, others DHCP. I would choose the latter. I don't see any reasons that would lead me to use PPPoE. I think that the only reason is that as I'd been using it, I would tend to continue to use it, but that's my view. Okay, the last question. The part where we handle the relay, that, that means that there's a double dynamic routing, or how does that part work? Now, 
for the client, the protocol continues to be the same. They use DHCP version 6 PD and they request a prefix, but that's not received by the server, but an intermediate, they intercept it. And they say, well, this is a, a, a request that I didn't receive it. I got it through a link local address and I won't solve it. It would be solved by a server that is remote. So, um, and then uh, it, uh, three, uh, two hops, and, uh, three hops intermediate with through a VPN. So I, as I don't know what to resolve, I send it to them. I encapsulate it, uh, um, and uh, I put, and I send it in a add additional information. The interface, the port it goes through, and I wait for the server to respond. The server responds, and I respond. I answer back to CPE. Nothing changes. Now, the only thing that you have to pay attention to is that the server now receives uh, unique uh, uh, solicitudes, not unicast, and uh, some of them only raise the service of MP541 in the local address. It's a case of care Linux. You need to tell them to uh, um, uh, use uh, the uh, service of now, the protocol continues to be the same. The structure of the message is forwarded, it's relay, and it changes a bit because it encapsulated the original request, but uh, the client doesn't notice anything. Now, if I understood it, if there's a double routing from the server to the relay and from the relay to, yes, yes, it's uh, yes, and if, and uh, there may be, if there are five hops, it will go through those five hops. Thank you. Good afternoon, David McMahon of TV Mask. Now, I, I have a concern upon implementing IPv6 to end users, and it is how do I do it? In IPv4, when I'm using a CGNAT, I had an address and a persistent uh, port to save uh, the navigation of users just in case, just uh, to abide by the law. Now in IPv6, when I use DHCP um, and I have prefixes, dynamic uh, prefixes, I'm losing that uh, uh, function. So how can I make those prefixes persistent? That's my first question. Any help? No, because he already answered it. Well, precisely one of the advantages of uh, having persistent prefixes is that you uh, avoid the need for logging because you know that this uh, client has this prefix. So any request that you receive through Leia, you know that it belongs to a certain client. The way you can do uh, make uh, the prefixes persistent the uh, easiest but it depends on uh, the platform you're using is to base on triple a and there you authenticate each client with their prefix there are other choices it depends on the vendor the dngs etc so there's an option for instance i said it earlier i think it's uh, option 37 of DHCP that with, with which you can equal DUV with uh, the client's uh, prefix. But it all depends on, uh, in addition to the standards, uh, you have, but it depends on the platform that you're using. The second is when you're implementing a relay server, how, Jordi already answered this, but I, have to implement a triple A in the relay in order to main, maintain persistence. Now, relay just forwards this to the server. So the server has a role of authentication and generally not even the server between this relay and the server. There is intermediary that a BNG which intercepts that request. It goes to the authentication with a MAC address and based on that, before or afterwards, it goes, it does a relay. So the VNG does everything. It does a relay, the triple A, it goes to the server, it waits for the response, reply, it maintains the state, it controls the bandwidth, but it's optional in all cases. You might have these in VNG without triple A, but it is recommended to have this for larger networks, to have a centralized control. Thank you. So many, many questions, that's good. So now let me go directly to the next part. Okay, well, first I wanted to 
show you a couple of considerations, and after that, I'll show you a table, and then finally we'll have a demo. How many minutes do I have left? Half an hour? 26. So this is very important. Here we started speaking about recommendations, and the, this is where we have the subjective part and what I can have in terms of experience. And each person will add or remove. Like Wesley said this morning, each IPv6 project is a world in itself. I don't know of any IPv6 project that is identical to another one. It's not about copy and paste. Of course, there's a baseline concept, you have experience and so on, you're doing things better and better, but there are different realities. Now, it is quite true that there are good practices. I think that any deployment of prefix delegation has to be accompanied by the addressing plan. Any recipe as to how to do a transition has to have an addressing plan. Don't repeat the experience of IPv4 of not doing this or only doing this when it's not so necessary. So a good addressing plan will help you to make things flow smoothly. Now, before starting that, there are some initial questions that we have to answer. So a client comes and wants advice on deploying an IPv6 project that involves prefix delegation. So first of all, we have to obtain the information. So you have to know the network. It's not the same for 100 to 100,000 or 500,000 networks. It's not the same as a mesh network or with a lot of rings or just a ring network. So I have to know the topology of the, net topology of the network, the devices, the vendors, the technical information. Some have IPv6 support. Do they support relay or don't they? Do they support all the options or not? Does it uh, routing uh, the delegated prefixes? Is a network access GPON or not? Do you have the OLT in layer 2 or layer 3? So how many clients do you have? It's not the same to have 10,000 to 500,000. If you go to China or to India, 1 million clients. 500 million subscribers, so maybe not as many, but we can speak about million. And always bear in mind the growth options. How many do I have now? What do we expect to grow? So view this over a th three to five year period and even to 10 years to see how I will be performing over time. So what is the IGP architecture like? Is it 6PE, 6VPE? Do I have a transition mechanism with an IPv6 only transport layer? Is this IBGP? Is it CPF? Is it what option do I have? Because many protocols allow you to add prefixes, others do not. Do I have an multiple errors or one single error of SPF? So now I assign prefixes to my client, so each will be assigning a route. If I do 100,000 clients and each client has a slash 56, then I have a slash a route for each client. That is a principle. We'll see later on that this is then added. So if I don't do things properly, I might have 200,000 routes in my border router. And if we come from IPv4, where the number of routes affects me, hopefully in IPv6, I don't have thousands, thousands of routes. So we have to see how we're doing things to see if we need to do some changes before putting IPv6 in the entire network. What are the transition mechanisms that I'm using? I'm going to IPv6 only or whatever. Do I have BNG or don't? Don't I? Do I want to have centralized or distributed provisioning? When U is in layer two or layer three, do I use IPOE or PPPOE? So I have to study the network to see what I have, and based on that, I will be learned the design. So once I have everything ready, once I have all the information, I mentioned two things, addressing plan, which I can then adjust. It's not the same to have a provisioning plan for 10,000 subscribers or 500,000 subscribers. Information on the network and inventory and the support and so on. And now I have to proceed to decision making. The OL, do, do use BRAS or not? OLT in layer two or layer three? And CPE is going to be in layer two. Now, the OLT, this is a good question. I'm going to put it in layer two or in layer three. Now, 
the high-performing OLTs, Huawei, Nokia, and some other brands so all these support layer 2 and layer 3 and all support the routing protocols for IBGP and many more so maybe they don't support 1 million routes but they do support 100 thousand routes so this is a decision i have to make i'm going to leave olt in layer two or in layer three i've had isps where the olt is in layer three and others where it is in layer two this is a relation of eight to two every 10 clients 80 percent are in layer two and two percent in layer three so this needs to be identical to IPv4. You can perfectly well put this in layer 2 for IPv4 and in layer 3 for IPv6. So you can decouple the traffic. Now, this is a decision that has to be made based on the information that you have on the network. So are you going to use relay or not? How are you going to use, you do transport? Is it going to be pseudo wire through the MPLS, VXLAN? Is the server going to be directly connected or not? So an, an interesting option is that the server, can it be in the cloud? Can it be in Miami, for example? Can I have a data center at Amazon? or AWS? That's a good question. So everything that this might be the case. So if this is a unicast request, remember that the servers could be in the cloud. You can have one in the cloud, one local one. I can outsource this, and this could be interesting. Now, then we have things that we have to do with design. So we all assume that we are in GPON. I'm going to use a server for the entire network or a server by point of presence or one per each OLT or one per card, per service, what happens with the telephone services, IPTV. So all these are things that I have to consider. These are decisions that I have to make. All these questions have to be answered. Now, going on to the server topic, is it going to be just one server active or standby? It's going to be a group. How am I going to manage redundancy? And all this has an impact on the addressing plan. Now, the answer to the addressing plan, for example, I have two DHCP servers that delegate A and B, and the two respond to points of presence, we assume that they are located in different places to have redundancy in terms of energy, of sites, of, of VLAN. So if my prefix is a slash 40, then I'm going to provisioning for a slash 38 or 39, and from there I get two slash 40s. If I pull from here and from there, and the point of presence publishes the entire slash 39. So no matter where the prefix comes from, these prefixes are dedicated to that point of presence. So this point of presence just gets the slash 35, 39, sorry, and the servers uh, slash 40, one each. That's one way. And the other is that the leases have a database and that these are synchronized. There are different ways to do these things. <coughs> so now, before going over to the cases, let me sit down so that I can show you two different tables. Now, personally, this has to do with my experience. I want I'd like to have the addressing plan and thinking about the delegation. I always divide the slash 32 of LACNIC into 16 slash 36. And this is what I use for the delegation. So normally, with two slash 36 prefixes, this should be enough. And otherwise, I take more. Here, I apply the technique of not taking these one after the other. So I can take F and then I could take number 8 or number 7 or 0. So that if one grows, it does not clash against the other one that is immediately next to it. I can take 0, I can take 8, take the 4. So I 
just select these, but not consecutive ones. So once I have done this, I then design the delegation based on slash 36. So the starting point is always slash 36. Let me remind you that I have to take this for data centers, for servers, enterprises, BGPs, links, the rings. So I subdivide this based on 36, and from then on, everything stems from one or several slash 36s. Now, this table here, I will try to share this with you afterwards, or so you just send me a, a, a mail and I'll let you know. On the left, we have the length of the base prefix taken from a slash 36. For example, if this is just one delegator, so if I have one that has a slash 40 as the base, this table expects to answer several questions. One, with that slash 40, how many delegators could I have from the entire slash 32? 256. It's quite simple. 40 minus 32. You can have 256 servers if I use the entire slash 32. I know that won't be the case, but this is just to give you an idea of the size. Now, how many slash 40s will I have from the slash 36? 16. These are very easy questions. And over here, once I have the base prefix, which is slash 40, if I'm going to work with the slash 40, which is one of the decisions I have to make, then how many delegated prefixes do I have available for that slash 40? The answer is that this depends on the length of each delegated prefix. This can range from a slash 48 through to a slash 64. I told you that already that I wouldn't go beyond a slash 60. Now, if from that slash 40, I delegate a slash 56, from that pool, I can have 65,000 clients. Now, well, if this is not enough, then a slash 57, which is 131,000, or 64, which is 262,000. So I the number of the this will depend on the number of prefixes it's quite a straightforward table just make the estimation and enter this in one single table so the pre length of the base prefix and this number over here gives you the amount of points of or the OLTs, if I go to the slash 40, slash 36, if I have a server for each OLT, I would have 36, where each one would have 65,000 uh, subscribers. Now, if I want a, a little bit more, a slash 52, now, then I sacrifice a certain number of subscribers. So moving in this chart up and down, I design it, and based on the information I uh, surveyed, because I, if I have half a million subscribers, here I have the total number, for instance, if I go with a slash 40 and with a slash 56, each server 65,000 subscribers, but in total 1 million, all of them slash 36. Now, if I have 2 million subscribers, then the, it's no good. I need to see in this line where I have to stand or what would be the minimum to have this number of uh, subscribers. So looking at the base and uh, the delegated prefix, I need to see the minimum and uh, design it based on that. That's why it's so important to explore the table based on the information surveyed. So it's not the same if it's a small ISP or a large ISP, the table helps me. Now, if anybody once it, I can make it available, but I repeat that by manipulating the numbers, it's very, very simple. Okay, ahora lo que les voy a mostrar es... Now I'm going to show a small demo so that you can see it as I run it. And some companies that I had a chance to prepare a project for GPON prefix delegation. I want to mention these three because they have authorized me to use their machines, not just for the deployment, but also for demos. The people of Nidix, Mexico, they are here today. Their company that they have over 25,000, 30,000 subscribers. I 
I think at least that, and they deployed IPv6 very successfully four or five years ago. They've grown, they have a huge amount of IPv6 traffic, and they use this technique of delegation of prefix. In Venezuela, we have Servitel and Connect.com people with more than 60,000 subscribers, all of them working with delegation of prefix, prefix delegation, very successful, much of the traffic. They're uh, oh, handling more than 100 giga and a significant part of the traffic such as edicts is in IPv6. They also have a content cache and in Argentina with our friends of Argentina, the people of Com Comtech, they're not as large, but they are growing in Salta, Argentina. Today they have about 15,000 clients, so they have allowed me to use their machines so that I, you can see these uh, um, systems working. So the first demo, as you, here I want you just to pay attention to the concept. I Here I'm not talking about a Microtech or Cisco or Huawei, just the concept, how you build a delegator. This is a server. This is a NEDIC server. For instance, here you have one of the points. Of basically, what you do, the first thing that you do when uh, is to create the pools. So here, for instance, they used a technique that's a sub, a, dele, a prefix delegator for each pawn port. So here, for instance, you have, a, uh, for instance, in uh, port one, and they have a delegator with a slash 48 of slash 56, understanding that there were 128 subscriptors. So here they are delegating 48, 56. Think that that port from 48 to 56, that gives you 256 delegated uh, prefixes uh, possible. You can even grow. So each uh, port has their own pool. Um, so here you have a slash uh, 48 and there you have a, a slash 56 and then what you do is to create a server. Here you create the options in Microtech, the options in our hexadecimals and here you can say the clients, their DNS, the domain, everything has to be indexed uh, hexadecimals and then the NTPH if they request it. The server doesn't uh, deliver this unless it's requested by the server. So you mount a server for each VLAN. In each server, you put the name of the server, the VLAN, where it's going to be mounted, the pool, and the timing. Here, here they haven't deployed permanence, but with times of one day, it looks quite uh, a lot like as if it were permanent. You load the options, you can integrate it with radio, that's not the case. They're going to integrate a brass very off very soon. And here there's an interesting parameter that's distance because one of the things that Microtech does and now all the routers are, is that when they delegate, a, they're delegated a prefix, they design the route. <coughs> here you have the famous leases and the delegated prefixes. Here, the famous uh, DOD, it delivers uh, slash 56 to each client. But once the prefixes are delegated, you see that in uh, the routing table, you have a route created for each uh, prefix delegated. So here you have them. Notice that this is a client. Notice that the gateway of that route is a CPE. This IP address is the link local address of that CPE. Without that, the client won't navigate. The, so the first, uh, this route had to be created by decree. Then I think Microtech used uh, version 627, if I'm not wrong, and they started to route the delegated uh, prefixes. These are important routes now think that these are 2,400 routes. That is why it's so important for all the delegation processes to be uh, in synthony with the routing protocol because I take those uh, uh, 2,400 routes uh, and then other, some others I'm going to have 50,000 route, routes and I need to prevent that uh, happening. So if you see uh, these prefixes, the pools are in sequence. This is A010. So this slash 48 
it should be part of a slash 40. What I do then is that the routing, instead of publishing the delegated prefixes, they publish the slash 40. So I have only one route that is slash 40, and that's very important because if not, I have to go backwards and the routers don't to have thousands of routes, and that's not necessary. That needs to be synchronized. So I'm also going to show you a demo of Contec in Argentina, and just the same. In this case, they are delegating 48 for two slash 56, a DHCP. Uh, in this case, they have distrib uh, distributed DHCP, the same options, and they do it quite well, and this, the routes issue. An interesting case is that of Conetcom Venezuela. They have an interesting case, and that is the ONT. When they receive the delegated prefix, they speak to OBS version 3. The, here you have it. And the ONT, when they receive uh, the delegated prefix, they announce it through um, this. Um, when you configure the one interface, here you have it in the ONT. It's going to open the interface. Let's uh, give it a chance. Now, if you realize the routing of the delegated prefixes, if you look at it, they are no longer static routes, but uh, CPFF th that were added by the ONT. They were announced by the DNT. They announced the LSA of that IPv6 route. And that's very important because if the ONT were to change or receive a different prefixes immediately, they would remove the other route and put this. There, it would be interesting that the access router to add that route, because here I have 654 routes. It would be interesting to add them. And if I'm going to add them as a SPF, I need to have different areas. And if I'm going to add it with a VDP, I, what I mean is that Always, the delegation of uh, prefixes has to do with the network uh, uh, routing, because it's not, it's a disaster. That's a very interesting case. And the other thing that I wanted to comment, uh, there are many projects like this in Latin America. I think that a lot of progress has been made in the last four years. The other thing I want to show is a small network I put together here. First, let me show you the topology that's very simple. I have, I don't have it at hand, but uh, I can tell you later. It's a Conetcom uh, agent. Yes, so that support, it took some time, quite long. This year, they'll start uh, with the bonus that publish the delegated prefix, but they are going to have to add it because if they put those 2,000 routes, then it's it's a mess with 50,000 uh, subscribers. The idea is to c publish the whole thing. So you handle the redistribution and the network. You have several ways. Now here I put together a client, a relay, a router here, and a server. The server, I mounted it in Kia. This is one of the LIM delegators, and in my view, it works quite well, and I wanted to see the setup. Basically, here there are two things that I want to comment. The first is that I need to tell there where it says interface. I have to tell them not to just to speak to link local address, but unicast. So in 100 and in GUA. Well, there you see the uh, pure prefix of documentation. And down here, I tell the delegation, this is your prefix, slash 48 to, flash, to slash 56. I want you to take a picture of this prefix. So here I'm going to do a TCD dump. Here um, and here, this is listening in uh, the GUA and uh, the link local address and in uh, Mod, unicast, so in uh, Moticus, Moticus, link local address and GUA. Here I'm going to put, I have a TCP, 
Uh, and here I have the client. The client is a microtick too. Just remember this. Notice the following. I tell the client is here. This one. This is a client. So let's zoom it. And I, so I tell the client, you are going to raise a client uh, VLAN 400, and you are going to request a prefix and a DNS, and do it with rapid commit to make it more efficient. And when they respond, you are going to keep it in a pool that is called a VLAN 100 pool. So I won't. I'm going to disable it, and I want you to see when I enable it, here there is a pool. In the pool part, there are no pools. As soon as I activate it, you're going to see that the machine requests the relay. It sends it to the server. The server responds. And what will happen is this. Here, they request that the prefix is here. It got here. Look at the prefix. Do you remember that I told you that it was uh, 2001 uh, DO800? Uh, this was the first prefix of a slash 48. And it puts the macrotic puts it in a pool. And there are no interfaces. They put it in a pool. The delegation process reaches there. Now, and with this, I'll finish. I can say, well, know what? I want to put an IP address in one interface. I want you to put in the magnifying glass here a slash 64 and to take an IP from that pool and use uh, EO64. Look at what happens. There you are. So this IP comes from a slash 64 that comes from a pool that comes from a, a prefix um, through a relay. So that's the outcome. Now that interface may be connected in, uh, 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 it may be in routed, etc. So that's what I had to tell you. I hope uh, you received uh, the information. Thank you all. If you have any questions, please, this would be the right time to do it. Thank you. A minute and a half for questions. Yes, good afternoon. And then remote uh, questions. Uh, I'm Miguel Torres from Colombia. Uh, concerning an issue of uh, dual assignment of DHCP where I should solve the problem so that they may only receive uh, addressing of the local server where you have to go to the server because it's the server that assigns you look at the pool and see if there's a MAC address duplication for instance in the server and if there's a relay there are several relays or if there are several servers in the same domain where the CPs are, it's there that you need to solve them, where you have the assignments at other servers, and second, the relay. Okay, thank you. There's something that I don't like about the table that you presented. It's a, it's a correct and a simple and user-friendly table, but they always start from a slash 32. No, a slash 32, but then the table is slash 36. Now, the issue is that maybe precisely, and that happened in other RIRs, because by default, they decided that they would deliver slash 32 to whoever requested, even if they didn't request IPv6, and that they were exempt from payment of slash 32. I think that as a community, we perceive that you are delivered a slash 32, and that's it. It's important to understand that the slash 32 is the basic point of departure, the baseline. But actually, the policies in all the regions allow you to have of your uh, registry in this case, LACNIC, a much larger prefix. And in addition, there is an you are exempted 
uh, in um, the price in the case of Lapnik and Apinik and other regions. So the most sensible thing is not to start from slash 32, but think that IPv6 is a pyramid, and there you put the clients. If you have 200,000 clients instead of a slash 32, you need a slash whatever, 28, for, yes, for instance. As a matter of fact, my arithmetic for clients to understand is, well, we deliver a slash 48 to the client if it's too large. Uh, keep it and give them only a slash 56, but save it because later on you'll see you need it. So in the base of the pyramid, we put the slash 48. That would mean that if you have 50,000 clients, uh, more or less depending on how you do the topology of your network, with a slash 42, you cover 100,000, uh, 200,000 uh, clients, uh, no, 50,000, and then uh, um, uh, 100,000 and 200,000. So you do a better addressing plan. And there are way different ways of uh, doing the uh, plan, the addressing plan, and it is demography based, looking for the largest number of potential clients that you can put in a pop and the smallest pop, and from then on to scale up the rest of the pops, and you save many, many addresses and many, many prefixes rather than addresses. Good, I agree. Now, before we leave, in 30 seconds, Jose, please. Gerardo Huerta sta states, the issue with IPv4 and NAT as a security measure is a system more inherited because of the scarcity of IPv4s. So, addresses in IPv4. So we could perfectly have an IPv6 only network with internal IPv6 uh, networks and not routed uh, publicly and a CPE with one uh, single doing a NAT66 and to obtain the same results of a NAT IPv4. Yes, technically it's possible. As a matter of fact, there are some vendors that uh, have it. Some vendors also have NAT66. I think it's going backwards. That's my view. That's the way I see it. I don't know, but it's like uh, going on with uh, what has caused so many problems. The problem is the state, the uh, uh, CPU and the memory of the state that is generated because it's an app. If I go to IPv6 and I have thousands of addresses not to have those tape and put it back again, in my view, it's a, a problem. It's, a, it's going backward. And finally, 20 seconds, Mr. Antonio Talavera was asking, how do, do you have the mechanism U64 with this uh, HTTPv6? Uh, Good question. Let me give you a practical case. When the UN receives a delegated prefix uh, slash 48 or 56, the first thing that they do without tell, you have to tell them, but is to take the first slash 64 of the pool received, uh, the first one, unless you give them a mathkin and they get uh, the uh, third or the fifth, so they take number one, that is zero, and they you put that slash 64 in the face that you did, and then they start doing HP and RA, and the clients will get that uh, RA announced prefix, and they do the uh, slash 64 and use temporary addresses, and they start to navigate, so you 64, there plays an important role to navigate and it, it's temporary because of our security so now it's break time we'll have to come back at 4 30 we we'll go on with Wesley who has two important topics thank you let me